So um, one of the things that I had been, you know, thinking about as I was praying ahead of time, okay, what is it maybe, Lord, that I might be talking about next time? What are you saying? And, um, and I'm really moved at so many levels uh, because there's such a depth to mine out in the book of Daniel of the things that are there. And um, <clears throat> there's some things that Daniel's consecrated life produced that he... Um, that are, that are talked about in chapter 10. And there were some things that I, I wanted to talk about with that, but I really felt like the Lord was leading me to talk about the subject of repentance and, um, and really the things that are in Daniel nine lay the foundation for the things that are happening, um, you know, in those in, in 10 and 11 and 12. And so I'm going to, um, I'm going to be talking about that kind of going back and forth and if the Lord leaves and I'll continue to talk more in depth about um, Daniel 10 in the um, in the, at the next time. So as I said, there's so much that's in the book that excites me and um, that I can learn from that inspires me and it, it definitely challenges me when you look at the life of Daniel and the way that he lived and the choices that he made. You, you feel um, like, how could I ever measure up? But it's really neat to see that this was a day-by-day -day process for Daniel. And so, um, like I said, I'm going to just touch on some important things that are at the heart of much of the rest of the book. And I believe that they're directly related to the times that we're living in. And the, so the theme of the book of Daniel, if we were to just kind of look at a, a broad view of it, it's the sovereignty of God over the kings of kingdoms of men. And that's probably pretty relevant right now. There's a lot of upheaval in the kingdoms of God right now. And there's a lot of, of voices out there about what should we do? And this is what we're going to do, or that's what we're going to do, or they're wrong and we're right. And so many different things that it's good to come back to the beginning, which is who is sovereign over the kingdoms of men? Clearly, clearly God. And we know that in Daniel's experience, there was quite a bit of upheaval that he experienced in his lifetime, starting with um, the captivity of the Israelites, of which he was among, and then moving into another, um, taken by a foreign empire, and then living through several um, tr transitions in that process. So not only that, but the primary subject of the book of Daniel beyond the sovereignty of God over the kingdoms of men is just the subject about the abomination and the false worship in the last days and the desolation that that brings. And so in Daniel nine, part of which we're going to talk about actually occurs at the same time of Daniel five, which was a good reminder for me because as you're reading Daniel sequentially and you look at that and you want to go ahead and turn to Daniel right now, by the way. <laughs> um, so that's kind of, that's kind of helpful to look at that um, because otherwise when you see Daniel 6, you're like, wait a minute, because that's actually happening a little bit later. But I'm going to give you a little bit of the backstory to, to, um, as we get going. So it's, it's five, um, when we're looking at um, Daniel 5 and Daniel 9, and I'm going to just turn to it with you. Hold on. And get everything up here. So Daniel um, 5 is this scene that we're familiar with. And we always think, I always think of my children's Bible where there's this hand, there's this big hand, a huge hand, and they're, there's like, they're all around, they're having a banquet, you know, and then there's this big hand writing on the wall in another language, and you're like, whoa, that'll, you, you, even before you could read, you're like, oh, I wonder what that story is about, right? So this is 539 BC, and the person that's reigning at this time is, is Belshazzar, and Belshazzar is actually the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, and he is very depraved, 
and he's ruling at that time, and there's intense pressure around them, and there are there's, you know, there are enemies around them, and um, you know, and he's 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 probably pretty nervous and just looking to probably, um, you know, in, in his in his pride and his arrogance, he was just. Um, um, he lost all understanding and, you know, and we know the story that they gathered all the gold cups um, that had been taken from his grandfather um, from when they um, invaded Jerusalem and then they're drinking out of the cups as if to say like, hey, we're going to overcome just like we did. Look at all these treasures that we have from our previous conquering of another kingdom. And of course, we, we know the story that that very night um, his life is taken from him. So he's killed um, He's killed that very night. And so this, this Daniel 5 is, is talking about that. As the Medes and the Persians took over Babylon. So what happened at following this is pretty immediately following this is Daniel found favor with Darius. And so we know Darius the Mede <clears throat> took over the kingdom at that time. And you could think of it since I'm, you know, was in the military. I just think about the fact that like, Maybe he was in the reserves or he was retired and he's brought back on active duty <laughs> um, for that particular time during that kingdom because that's kind of the way you can see it um, coming out in Daniel 5 as it's describing Belshazzar's demise. But this, like I said, this is happening the same time as the passage that we're about to read. So I'm going to start in Daniel 9, 1 through 3. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, Xerxes, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans in the first year of the reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in desolation of Jerusalem. Then I set my face towards the Lord God to make request by prayer, supplication, with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. So, you can, I, I mean, I'm just imagining to myself that Daniel has um, established a lifestyle of just searching the Lord's heart, seeking him out. How could you live through all of that stuff? How could you even have survived it? We know from the previous stories of his friends and the fiery furnace and, and all of these intense things. He, he was in a close connection with the Lord, wasn't he? He definitely was. And he, he was living a consecrated life. In Daniel 6.3, it says, then this, Dan, then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and the satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king gave him, and, and, and the king gave through to setting him over the whole realm. So not only was Daniel not focused on political power, as you can kind of gather, but he wasn't focused in on money, um, in other words, whatever, whatever the crisis that the reigning kingdom was dealing with at that time, which was multiple crises that they were going through, he was not focusing on that. He was actually focused on the promises and the purposes of God's heart. So um, and I think that's encouraging to us, really, because we think there's a lot going around us right now. And there was definitely a lot going, or going on in the time of Daniel, right? But he was intently seeking revelation from the Lord. And he studied. What was he studying he was studying the prophets. I mean, I think about the fact, like, if you think like what we do sometimes is we're studying the scriptures and we're trying to connect these messages that are all the same message that the Lord is speaking, revealed by his spirit through different people, different human beings. This is what he's doing. He's searching it out and he's reading in Jeremiah. He's reading Jeremiah's prophets writing. So the focus was on God's word and the fulfillment of the prophecy. And this gave Daniel clarity. I mean, can you imagine he's, he's reading the prophets and he's saying, Oh my gosh, all of these things that they said that they warned about, I am living in those days. That ought to be pretty sobering for us right now. You know, I mean, I think it's one thing to talk about this and, and to say there's these prophecies and they're going to come to pass and so on. But when you actually, and especially it, it kind of, there's a lot of weight on that. You know, for those that oh, we've been talking about these things for a period of time and we've been um, saying these certain things are going to be happening and coming and this is what the word says and, and, and this is what it means. And then when they start to begin to happen, it's, that's, um, th that should be sobering to us. That should be like 
stand at attention, wake, wake up, what's happening here, and, and how am I supposed to respond? So he was, I think this, this is what I'm imagining. I try to ask the Lord, help me understand where was the perspective of Daniel and what was he looking at? So he's reading about things that were said were going to happen, and they did. They definitely did, and he was living the reality as a result of that. So um, the focus on God's word and its fulfillment of prophecy gave Daniel the clarity he needed really during a time of great turmoil. We're going to read um, a good chunk of Daniel 9, but before that, I just want to fast forward to chapters 10 through 12 just to highlight a few things. Just want to give you a reminder of the events that occurred in that chapter, and um, it's kind of long, so we're not going to read it in chapter 10 because we might uh, spend more time in that next week or next time, but we know that Daniel had an angelic encounter, Right. Um, he had a he had a heavenly visit, and you can see the description of the mighty angel that came and the impact that it had on Daniel in chapter ten. And there, you can even see the angel revealing to him this conflict that was going on related to Daniel's prayer, because when he first began to set his heart to pray and seek God's face, the the angel was sent to come to Daniel. But we know the story that the angel was being resisted by evil forces in the spiritual realms. And so Daniel was given divine strength and, um, you know, and then what happens out of that is there is a bunch more revelation that Daniel is given. And so I'm going to kind of get into this in detail, but, and come back to this, but I think what I really want to start off is just getting us a picture. What's happening is Daniel is humbling himself. He's fasting, he's praying, he's ardently ardently seeking God's face. He's like, I've got to hear him. I've got to, um, I got to know what he's saying. I'm reading these things about the prophets, but what, what are you saying? What's the rest of the story? He's ardently seeking the Lord and, and it's working, isn't it? Because there was, there was a response to that. And part of that, part of what we're going to find out, what, what was the elements of that ardent seeking of the Lord? And that's what we see, um, as we jump into Daniel 9. But just to finish up that point of 10, what's happening in 9 and what happens in, in 10 is the context of receiving the fourth vision that Daniel received, which was in chapters 10 and 11. And that, that is, um, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, that's about what the abomination of the, and the desolation is going to look like. And it's the longest and most detailed prophecy in the Bible. And it gives insights into the Antichrist's political decisions, his religious attitudes, military activities just as well as the great tribulation and Israel's deliverance. So that is a lot of stuff. That is a lot. I mean, that is major, like, whoa. I mean, when you really try to think about it, sometimes we just, yeah, we take it for granted. But, and it, it's also, as I just mentioned, it's revealing the conflict between the spiritual realms. And it's, it's giving us insight into what happens in those spiritual realms when we pray. Um, so I'm going to... Um, uh, jump in in the beginning part of Daniel. So in the first year of Darius, the son of Ozerxes, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year, his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the book of the number. I think I already read this. So we know he's reading from Jeremiah, and he's talking about the 70 years um, of the desolations of Jerusalem. And then look at three, verse three. Then I set my face towards the Lord God to make request by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. So let's try to get into Daniel's world for a minute. He was a captive as his youth, as I mentioned. So just think about, like, if you're a youth here, um, you know, probably, I mean, let's just say maybe um, anywhere between maybe Abigail and Lena's age or Jeremiah. You can think about Jeremiah. That'd be a good one. Um, He's, he's that age when he's, I mean, just imagine from, it's like you're taken completely away from the United States. You're torn away from your family and everything that you know. You're torn away from your school. You're torn away from your neighborhood. You're torn away from everything that was life to you. And you're taken off to uh, North Korea. <laughs> you know, I mean, just like completely different place. And you don't know. You, I mean, your life is totally upside down. I mean, can you, you imagine? I mean, he was, he, he had nothing. I mean, he had a few friends, but he had nothing. He was, he would be totally um, dependent on the Lord. So at this place, 
he's reading from the prophet Jeremiah. And I think it's helpful, really helpful, um, to remember some of the details regarding Jeremiah because I feel like I can relate to Jeremiah because um, he was a reluctant uh, prophet in the beginning. And I often um, confess and repent that I am a reluctant person to, <laughs> to voice things, but the Lord is not done with me yet. But Jeremiah lived during the final days of the crumbling of the nation of Judah. And he was the last prophet of God that was sent to, tr to preach to the southern kingdom, which basically boiled down to Judah and, and Benjamin. And God repeatedly warned Israel to stop their idolatrous behavior. He kept on warning them, turn back to me. But guess what? They wouldn't listen. They definitely wouldn't listen. So he sent the 10 northern tribes into captivity. And now God sent, that was with Assyria, and, and then God sent Jeremiah to give Judah this last warning, like, okay, I've already, guess, look what's already happened to your sister. Look what happened to the other 10 tribes of Israel, and you're next if you don't change your ways. So um, he gave him that last warning before decimating that nation and sending them into captivity with Babylon, where Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem. So he warned them because of their unrepentant sin. So God was removing from them the land and he was going to take them out of it and he was going to give them to a pagan king. And there was a lot of inner turmoil that Jeremiah was having, like just like being, just like the youth that Daniel was, so was Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a youth about 17 years old, I think, when God called him and he was having, uh, can you imagine the, the, the turmoil that he was having over the fate of his people? I mean, I think like... I should want to have that kind of turmoil. I mean, it's a supernatural thing to ask the Lord to give us the turmoil of the turmoil to be able to see what's going to happen if my, fr my friends and my family and my community um, and my nation doesn't turn back to God. Um, you know, because I think it's easy to kind of disconnect from that, but we probably do want a piece of that. We want a piece of that, um, of God's heart in that. Because we need it to be able to pray, to intercede. And so this is what's happening for him. He's already seen the turmoil and the death and the sorrow that's happened to his people. But Daniel has, but, but Jeremiah is actually prophesying it. And he was begging the people to listen. He was called a weeping prophet. And it's because he cried tears of sadness. He knew what was about to happen. And can you imagine like having visions of things that are about to happen? Um, terrible, terrible things. And then wanting to be able to communicate that to other people, but no one would listen. And this is really what was happening to Jeremiah. No matter how hard he tried, the people would not listen. I mean, he's like, this is last call, people. <laughs> There's been all these prophets, and I am trying to tell you, death is at the door. Plus, he didn't have any human comfort. You know, God God forbid him to marry and have any children. And, uh, you know, he... he he had, his friends had turned back on him. I mean, the, he was lonely. He had the burden of the impending judgment. But God knew that for Jeremiah that he wasn't going to want to have a wife and a children because of the days that were coming ahead, that it was going to be um, the babies and children um, and adults would be dying grievous deaths, that there would be horrible conditions that would be coming, people eating their children, people turning on one another, I mean, just, just, you know, flesh being devoured by the birds, you know, bodies not even able to be buried. I mean, we, we just can't even imagine. We really just can't even imagine. But God knew that that was the best course for Jeremiah because he knew the impending judgment that was coming. And what had happened then, which is happening now, is that people hardened um, their hearts because of the numbing effect of sin. Sin is numbing. Delu it's delusion because what happens is that the more that you, you know, just you agree with a little bit of this and a little bit of that, that's why repentance is so important. And like this is a, this is a little pet sin. It's not a big deal. This is not that. I mean, compared to other people, my goodness, are you kidding? I mean, this is this is nothing. You know, I mean, but I don't I don't I don't think we want to think things are little things. You know, I was I was late this morning, and I I don't think I. I think that is not an okay thing. You know, the fact that everybody else was able to be here and at, like everybody here was here before me is judgment against me that, hey, it's possible that you could do, you know, you, I, I need to repent, right? I need to say I'm sorry to God. I need to say sorry to you because it's important. So 
he preached um, the fear of the Lord, but the fear of the Lord had been gone. And he preached for 40 years, and he, he saw um, nobody changing their minds. The people were stubborn, and the people were hard-hearted. And it probably seemed like at the time, and I think this is an important message for us, when, when sometimes the enemy might say to us, it doesn't matter Nobody cares. Nobody's listening. Nobody's not going to affect anything anyways. But the, but the thing is, is that it, it might feel like it's pearls before swine to have God's standard, but this is not so because Jeremiah's faithful life and his words were convincing every person who heard them and refused to heed the warning that it was possible. That's what, um, you know, it's similar to Noah, the whole idea of, of Noah building the ark and inviting people to hear the voice of the Lord and to repent. His life was yielded to submitting to the voice of the Lord. He demonstrated this life of yielding and repentance, and that just proved that it was possible, and it was a judgment to everyone else that this was possible. This was the same thing with Daniel. He had lived such a consecrated life that when Darius's um, kingdom took over, I mean, the the oligarchy of his top people were like, we got to take this guy out. He's making us look bad. He's exposing, um, you know, our uh, debauchery. I mean, he, he, our sin. He was, it, it's um, a life lived in faithfulness actually is proving to everyone else around that it's possible. And that is a form of a judgment, because it means you can't, it comes against this false grace message that it's okay, God understands, he's got grace for you. And no, it says, nope, the grace is not an excuse to just keep going as I was. The grace is the power that I need to actually live this standard that God is calling me to because he requires holiness. And so when you do that by the power of the Holy Spirit, that tells everybody else it's possible. So back to Daniel, um, he's taken some time to look back, search the scriptures, the prophets, and he ardently, ardently wants to know God's heart. Friends, I, I don't think I ardently want to know God's heart as much as I want to. I feel ardent at moments. I have ardent moments. But then I'm like, what do I do when I'm don't feel like it, or I don't want to get up as early, or I don't want to give up on my sleep, or I don't want to give up on my food, or I don't want to, I don't want to give up on my comfort, or I just, I just, right, whatever that is for you. The thing about the comforts and the reason why the fasting and praying is so important, because those things dull us from the desperateness for God, the desperation to see him because he's really looking for desperate wanting to see him, not a casual wanting to see him. It's the whole bride analogy. Like, do we want to be married? Do we really want to know him? And it takes a commitment, which we need the help of the Holy Spirit to be able to do. So Daniel wanted to know why all this suffering? Where do we go from here? How do we respond? Will I ever get home again? That would be a big one, right? I mean, am I going to live long enough? I'm talking about 70 years of captivity, like how long am I going to be around? So I'm going to keep going in Daniel verse four. And I prayed to the Lord, my God, and made confession and said, oh, Lord, great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those that keep his commandments. We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. So not just his precepts, like his judgments, like when he sifts us, like when, when he punishes, when he, or di when he disciplines, he disciplines those he loves. I mean, have you ever had the discipline of the Lord and you're like, you're mad about it and you're indignant about it? Never. I know it's never happened to me either, but, um, but the, yeah, he's saying that neither, verse six, neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets. We wouldn't listen. We were hard hearted who spoke in your name to our kings and our princes, spoke to our leaders. The prophets tried to speak to the leaders, but they wouldn't listen to our fathers and all the people of the land. They were saying, he's basically saying like, God, you are not the problem. It is me. It is us, right? We actually need this kind of an attitude as he's, as he's releasing his hand of restraint and, and, 
and things are happening that he allows, ha- that, that things will happen on the earth and are happening that he allows to happen. We've got to have his perspective in it. We, if you, you know, this is a big thing that I, the Lord has really been working on my heart in is just that like, I need to know he's good. I just want to know he's good no matter what. I mean, I want to, I want to be able to be in that, you know, that Job situation and just say, Lord, I just, I, I don't understand, but I know you're good. And I know that you're for me. This is agreeing with him. This is part of agreeing with his judgments is just saying, I trust you. I trust you. I trust you in my family. I trust you in my circumstances. I trust you. It's a daily thing, isn't it? Verse 7, O oh Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us shame, <clears throat> shame of faith, shame on us, as it is this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, all the people of Israel, those near and far, and those far off in all the countries to which you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. See, do you see this? Like he's talking about, he's not just talking about himself because like Daniel was like, he was like, a, I mean, we would look at him and, and say, you don't need to repent for anything. Are you kidding? Look at your life that you've lived. But he's talking about himself and his nation. He's including himself in that whole thing. And it took some time. You can imagine this has taken some time that Daniel is spending seeking his face. You, can you just see him crying out? for God's perspective in the situation. Um, he, like I said, he'd been through so much suffering. Um, he was reaping what had been sown, wasn't he? And the people were reaping what had been sown. And you can, I, I mean, can you hear his sorrow? He's like, oh God, oh God. That's what we need to say right now. Oh God. Verse eight, oh Lord. To us belongs shame of face to our kings, our princes, and our fathers because we have sinned against you. This is like, oh, Lord, shame belongs to us because of our leaders, political groups, religious leaders, people of influence because we've sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which we set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as to not obey your voice. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the serving of the the servant of God has been poured out against us because we have sinned against him. So it he's it's just like, okay, this is what you said. You you he laid this out in in the um in the Pentateuch, you know, he, blessings and curses, Deuteronomy, you know, if you follow me, this is, it's going to go good with you. If you don't, it's not going to be good. It's going to be bad. So repenting for others, for himself, it's agreeing with God's judgments. And he had, has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our judges who judged us by bringing upon us a great disaster for under the whole heaven, such has never been done as what has been done in Jerusalem, as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster judgments has come upon us. Yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord, our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. It's repenting. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, right? Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn it. That's that's the way it happens. Matthew 5, 3, and 4. Therefore, the Lord has kept the disaster in mind and brought it upon us. For the Lord, our God, is righteous in all the works in which he does, though we have not obeyed his voice. Obeying his voice, agreeing with his judgments, agreeing with his commands. And now, our Lord, our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made yourself a name, as it is this day, we have sinned. We have done wickedly. Do you think that it's just something that um, Daniel needed to do and it doesn't apply to us? Of course, we know. We know that this is not the case. Let's just keep going further. Verse 16, O Lord, according to all of your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because of our sins. And for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to all those around us. 
So again, he's repenting on behalf of the nation of Israel. Now, therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications. For the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. What's he talking about? Cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. Jerusalem. Oh, my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations in the city, which is called by your name. It's his city. It's his land. I mean, it's his. It's like we're his children. That's his land. It's, it's like it's his house, um, but it's a city in which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds. So it's not because we're like saying, please do this, Lord, because look at us and all the things that we're doing. We're so good. But it's because of your great mercies. Oh, Lord. And just hear the the action words that he's using. And I know these are all things that Tom has talked about before. Um, I'm kind of reviewing things that, that are so important just to come back to. Oh, Lord, hear. So he's saying, oh, Lord, forgive. Oh, Lord, listen. Oh, Lord, act. Do you think Daniel believes this? I just think, yes. I think he ardently believes it. Like, Lord, hear, forgive, listen. Would you act? Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. So, okay, as I was putting in this, the song came to my mind, all is for your glory. You You know, this is the whole thing he's thinking. He's talking about you, Lord, Daniel, He's saying, Lord, because of who you are, uh, you, Lord, I mean, you're the maker of heaven and earth. Lord, because of this place that you said was your promised land, because of Jerusalem. And, and also, Lord, because of your people, your people that are supposed to reflect you on the earth. He's saying, for all of those things. Think about that song, you know, all is for your glory. All is for your glory. All is for your name. All is for your glory. That in all things that you may have the first place. That's what he's saying. Daniel's saying, Lord, I want you to have the first place in all things. That in all things that you would have preeminence. Daniel really had a glimpse into God's heart, didn't he? He wanted his name to be glorified. He wanted his city to be glorified. It's kind of neat. I won't get into it now, but, you know, it's really neat if you look into the, the, the definition of, like, Jerusalem and, like, the meaning of that. You know, it's, it's his city. So I'm going to jump to Jeremiah 29, 10 through 14. You can go there if you want, but I think we're all pretty familiar with this. For this is, this is often quoted in a different context. It's kind of like, hey, it's okay. Put your chin up. It's all good. God's got plans for you and they're going to be awesome, (laughs) you know, except for when you realize, wait a minute, did you know anything about Jeremiah? What is going on at the time of what he's writing? He's talking about people that have just been, their whole nation has been invaded and they've been sent off to North Korea, like using that example. But so verse 10, for thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed in Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good towards you and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not for evil. That's a good thing to remember when you're in the middle of captivity. You're a slave. <laughs> You've been separated from your family. Maybe you haven't seen anybody you grew up with. You're in a foreign land. You don't even speak the language. I mean, that would be encouraging to be able to hear, right? Right. Um, that he has, he, he has thoughts towards us, says the Lord, thoughts of peace, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me. Then you, when you search with me all of your heart, and I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your act captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations and the places for which you were driven, says the Lord, and I will bring you to the place for which I cause you to be carried away captive. I just think about the fact that, yes, he's he's like, I, listen, I know this looks bad, but I'm telling you, I am in this. And, and you know, you needed to be humbled. I needed to discipline you, but you are going to call upon me and I'm going to listen. I'm not going to turn my back on you. I'm going to, I'm going to restore your land 
Maybe it's just going to not affect you. It's going to affect your children. But he, there's, there's a hope in that of knowing that in the midst of they were in judgment, but he's saying, I still have good in mind for you. And the, and the message here is like, judgment is not evil. Judgment is his mercy. He's looking to bring, he's like, you were destined um, for eternal desolation, but I made a way through your circumstances that you stopped you, the course and the direction that you were going on. It's, this, is, this is radical, heartfelt repentance. And what's really cool about what we see happening in the, this is, so this is chapter nine. And what happens after this is this radical, ardent, earnest, dying to self, crying out in desperation to God was answered by a visit from Gabriel. What do you think? Why? What purpose do you think was for? Was for? More revelation. He gave him more revelation, didn't he? Because all these prophecies were released at that time. So God's heart was moved. And what's really, I, what I love about this is just the fact that this is, this is the way that works. And, and I just want to be reminded here that ardently searching the Lord out, clean, getting clean myself. What this does is this puts me in a better, better position to be able to see. Um, I, I, I think about being in a plane Right. I was asking the Lord, Lord, just give me some, give me some Jen stories. Like these stories are great. I love the, the, the dream that Smyrna just um, gave, you know, like I can hang on to a picture that really helps me. So I'm picturing being in a plane and we know that most of you probably do that. There's thousands of course adjustments that go on in a plane with a pilot. So I picture being in a plane and what's happening is the plane is going and um, it's got a course adjust. Thousands of times, like within a flight, depending on how long the flight is, right? And so what happens if you don't adjust? So if I'm, I'm the, the pilot in the plane, if I don't adjust constantly, <laughs> then I'm just, my little bits of getting off and off, my tiny little, teeny little getting off is getting me off into a way different direction. Do you know what I mean? If I'm not constantly in this place where I'm off, oh, I got to get back on, oh, Oh, I'm, I'm off a little bit. I got to get back, you know, wait, I'm over here. Because this is, this is what I picture. And this is really what happens. Somebody with a seared conscience, they can't even hear the Lord anymore. They don't spend any time listening to the Lord. They're going in their own rebellion. They're going in their way. I'm going in my own rebellion, my way. This is a good plan, Lord. It seems right to me. But he says in the end, it leads to death. Then what happens is that I, at, at some point in time, and I don't even realize this happened because you don't feel it. Like when you're in a plane, can you tell? Like, all you got is a bunch of clouds all around. You don't have any landmarks to be able to tell you that you're way off course, right? They say for a pilot, they don't even know sometimes if they're upside down. I mean, you, you need instruments to be able to keep you on track. Before time, I'm way over here. And there's something that he needs me to, to be focused in on and wants to show me something. But my view has changed. I'm viewing over here where the thing he wants to show me is over here, but I'm so out of alignment with him that I can't even see it. Do you understand? This is what happens when we're in rebellion with the Lord. We could all look back at circumstances in our life and just say, there's this thing that um, I just couldn't see it because I was so in my own path. I just couldn't see it. Cause, and we, and the, the point of all of this is we need to see. We desperately desperately need to see. Do you think that if there's a storm coming on and you're in the plane and there's about to be a hurricane and there's about to be like all of this wind activity going on and there's, there's, it's not a time that planes want to be in the air and you're in the air and you, do you need your instruments? Do you need to be able to make sure that you're connected to the control tower of your instruments that are showing you if you're on track? We, we desperately need to because I need to know when I need to take that plane down. I need to know when I need to take the plane up. I need to know when I need to move to the right. I need to know when I need to move to the left. I need to know something is coming ahead, you know, Mount Everest. And if I don't go up, I'm about to hit it. I, I, I need to know when I'm too high where the oxygen is getting too low. I mean, I need to see. And so in order to see, it's, it's really interesting because I'm emphasizing this so much because when we get to a point where there's, there, there's a shaking that's happening and there will be responses all over the earth to this shaking. And some of them are going to be like, hey, we're going to um, 
uh, let's let's find the leader that seems like they know what they're talking about, you know, and then get behind them. And um, but there's going to be religious movements where they're going to there's going to be a group of people and they're gonna like, OK, I, somebody seems like they know what they're doing. They got to they, they sound good on the outside. They're going in a certain direction. Um, but the thing that we have to measure whether we're really on course with is the is what Daniel is doing in nine, like true revelation, what happens with the true revelation that comes in 9 and 10 and 11 started happening in verse 9 and it happened with repentance. It happened with him humbling himself and praying and saying, I am not, you know, my nation has got off. I, I'm, I imagine that Daniel was way doing this before that. He was, he was working out his own salvation with fear and trembling. And as he was getting cleaner and cleaner and seeing more clearly and getting more aligned and learning to live in a constant alignment with the Lord, that what ended up happening is that he's ardently seeking the Lord. And the Lord says, there's something I want to show you. Keep flying in this direction. Stay lined up with me. And there's something that's coming up over here that you really need to know about because it's, it's going to affect, it's about the future. And, and then what happens is he shows him because he was so lined up to him. Friends, we want this, don't we? We want this. And this is the reason why we don't want to be mistaken about the fact that um, seeing requires a tremendous level of holiness and consecration. It requires that like when we see these things and we know these things that we don't just like wander away from it. I mean, it could be easy to say like, oh yeah, we've been talking about Revelation study. We started this a couple, three years ago and like, yeah, I'm not surprised these things are happening. I don't be, that's so, you want to have a casual attitude about it. Like, well, I knew before. No, what was the response to that? That's like wisdom. The wisdom is the response. Like Daniel's like, they're already in captivity. The damage has been done. But he wants to get aligned to the Lord. He's still fasting and praying and praying three times a day and seeking his face and um, not getting tired of this process. Because when we, the Lord is continuing to show us more things, I, th I think it revives our heart because he, he's, um, we, we keep seeing you don't get bored. We're not going to be bored like we, Tom talks about a lot. We're not going to be bored in heaven. So we, we need to see that. But um, <clears throat> what it's also good to know about is that this reality of repentance, which is ongoing and it's intense and it requires each other. Um, it's disruptive. It's a disruptive reality. It's a disruptive to ourself, to our family, to our extended family, to our community around us. It's really super um, disruptive and we need to, we need to be aware of this. You know, um, if you're not in a situation where there's like some contentions going on in your house, <laughs> I mean, we talk about this laundry is happening and it's, it, it it's been like, you know, we started on the gentle cycle, uh, <laughs> right? but it's, it's ramping up. We're about to do, you know, sheets and comforters and, um, it's going to be a heavy load and, um, we want to know that going into it and, um, and, and be in a constant place of lining up with him. Our homes is a great place for this to happen. You know, as we, we need each other to look at where, I mean, I need to be working on this plank in my eye. Um, but I really do. And, you know, and, and maybe Lonnie needs to be working on his and, and, and Jen needs to be working on hers and Angie needs to work on hers. But I also still have this speck in my eye and I really do need their help to see the speck in my eye too. And oftentimes it doesn't mean because they come to me and they say, hey, by the way, you got a pretty chunky looking speck going on there. But it might be that what they're doing is they come up here and they pray about something and they're like, Lord, I am, I repent because of this thing. And then I'm like, oh, <laughs> I am definitely guilty of that too. In fact, probably worse than them, <laughs> right? That is like, the, the needing each other to be able to see that. And sometimes it might mean, which is, this is, I'm talking to myself really more than anybody. Sometimes what this might mean is that I am saying, um, the Lord saying, you need to say that thing. And I'm like, oh, do I have to? God, I don't really want to. I, I honestly, I don't, I do, I, I don't do this well at all. I really, really don't. I, I need God's help to do it, but he, he can help me. Now my, my immediate family would say, oh, she doesn't have a problem at all. <laughs> it's a lot easier when, it, when it's your own family member. But I hope that this is what it looks like 
going on in your house is this repenting process, not just here, but there. It's like I'm having a, a, a discussion with purpose with a family member, and they're saying, well, you know, you do that too, and well, why don't, you know, and, or and, and maybe something specific, well, how about the time, da-da-da-da, and I, I'm like, ooh, you know, like, and like, I'm sorry. <laughs> this sometimes we, I'm in the middle of yelling. I'm like, I know you're right. That's true. Dang it. <laughs> As I'm still in the yelling process. Like, I'm sorry. <laughs> and then I might have to, and I, I need some time. But the thing is, is that this is a start is the immediate recognition of stopping in your tracks and being able to, to say that in humility. And even if because I don't know about your house, but in my house, it's 99% them, let me tell you. <laughs> it's only 1% me, but I'm going to be responsible for my 1%. No. <laughs> um, I need, we need the Lord to see it. We definitely need the Lord to see it. And so we want, we want to welcome this activity in, in our home, which seems like count it all joy. Yay. We're going to have some good opportunities for that as we're all homebound a little bit more right now at this part. But this should be really an invitation because we want to say, Lord, I, I really need to see where I'm at in the middle of this. I really, really do. I need to be living in such humility, which means you're probably going to be messing up on a constant basis. But as long as you're repenting on a constant basis, you're good. Do you know what I mean? <clears throat> Because this is really what helps us purify our, each other. And what happens is that our choices are agreeing with God. Agreeing with God is agreeing with his judgments. This is what it is. When you are complete agreement with him, you're standing with him. I want you to picture any movie or anything that you've ever seen is like somebody says, no, well, this is what we're going to do. And then you got somebody on the other side. And then you get people sitting all around, right? You know, and the other one says, no, we're going to do this. And then the one says, no, this is the right thing. And then all of a sudden you see some people along the sides. They get up. And then they, every movie has one of these scenes, right? Not every movie, but there's a lot of movies that have this scene. Then you have somebody over the side that says, well, I'm standing with them. And then somebody else says, me too. And then before you know it, like you've got the bad guys over here and then the good guys over here and they're all standing together, right? David's smiling. He knows what I'm talking about, right? The idea is that you're a witness. Your standing for that true thing causes people to come around you um, and, or gives them the choice. And that's what Jeremiah was doing, saying, this is the right thing. This is the true thing. And nobody, like, I don't, I don't think I recall reading about anybody else that, that, was re that received favor, favor from the um, Babylonian um, conquering army than Jeremiah. I can't remember what happened with Brute, but um, I have a movie clip that the Lord brought this movie to my mind. And um, I, it's so funny because I'm not a big movie. I, I don't watch a lot of movies. I really don't. And I, I probably watched this movie, I would imagine, at least 15 years ago. I couldn't even think of the name of it. But I had this scene in my mind, and I was like, okay, Lord, I'm going to take that. That is from your Holy Spirit. And the, I, I'm not endorsing this movie. I don't even know. I'd have to rewatch it. So who knows what else might be in it? I don't know. But I'm just going to point out this part. That, and I have a little movie clip that looks like I got some assistance back there on. Um, but the name of the movie is called The Last Castle. And it's a, oh, 2001. Well, there we have kind of an even idea. <laughs> it was a long time ago. American, it's an American action drama film directed by Rod Lurie, starring Robert Redford um, and James Gan Gandolfini. Um, and the film portrays a struggle between inmates and the warden of a military prison based on the United States disciplinary barracks at Fort Leavenworth. So you have a highly decorated U.S. Army lieutenant general. So he's up there. He was high up there. This was Robert Redford. He's court-martialed. He is sentenced for insubordination, and then he's sent to this prison. And he challenges the prison commandant, uh, who's a colonel, over his treatment of his prisoners. So he was like lower ranking. Like you see in the beginning of the film, it's like this general was like a hero to this commandant. He's like, oh, you're coming to stay in my place. 
I'm going to treat you well, and you're going to get, you know, special treatment. And, you know, and there's like this, this, this thing, he really looks up to him. But what ends up happening is that um, the colonel over uh, challenges the commandant over his treatment of prisoners. And after mobilizing the inmates, it says that the, the former general leads an uprising. And what's, what, what happens is, I don't want to completely spoil it for you in case you want to do it, but what happens is that choice after very nonviolent, very calm, very standing for truth choices after choice after choice after choice. It wasn't, de he wasn't defined, he wasn't, let's get a, up, let's get a, um, what's the word I'm looking for that's happening all over, like everybody gets to get, what? Yeah, it wasn't a coup, and it wasn't, it, it wasn't a, we're going to all, you know, go in the courtyard and march against, you know, the war. It wasn't a protest, thank you. It wasn't anything like that. It was just this, he was standing for truth. And what happened is over time, people that were sitting on the sidelines or making no choice lined up with him, you know, and at the end, it's a kind of a bittersweet end, but justice was seen. I won't tell you in case you want to watch the movie, but we're going to watch this little clip because I think there's a lot for us here. Will I be in the way? Put your hand down. Put turn, it up. It up, turn it up a little bit. You don't have to do this. Can you guys hear it? Prisoner Irwin, I understand your coming here must be a big adjustment for you. To go from commanding thousands of troops in battle, to having no war to fight and no one to follow you must not be easy. However, I do ask that you learn how things are done around here and try to set an example for the other men. Saluting is prohibited. Aguilar was saluting. He is being disciplined. Surely you understand that. Captain, take the prisoner back to his cell. Hey, sir. Sir. Did the prisoner speak, sir? Yes. According to the manual of conduct, the corporal punishment for a prisoner begun on the day shift cannot exceed the following morning's horn. Prisoner Irwin, you are absolutely right. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Captain? Captain. Yes, sir. If you caught the, um, the facial expression of the of the captain that he was saying, you know, even at the very end, I mean, he's kind of like, right? He's kind of in awe as he's um, seeing that the, the choice and the standing for truth. And, and what happens is, again, just the movie just keeps going, that he just keeps standing for, he's, he, he's quoting to him, um, you know, the, the legal code for how disciplinary action is supposed to happen. And so he's, he's standing for that, for that standard. And the reason why I just, I thought that was good is just because it's just a good reminder to us that what we do here is disruptive. It comes with a sobriety. Anyone that comes to Light Hop is they, they come in, they, this environment feels really good and it feels like, wow, something is happening here, but it comes with a level of commitment to get clean yourself. And um, otherwise, what happens is it's really like putting new wine in an old wineskin. We need to be changed. We need to be, we need to be ready. You know, um, we, we, we've been putting off, putting off for I don't know how many 
years, like certain like projects and I think I, Lonnie and I finally came to the conclusion, somebody actually gave us a suggestion, why don't you refinish your <clears throat> original floors instead of get rid of your 20 year old carpet or whatever, <laughs> I don't know. Um, and um, we're like, yeah, we'll look into that. So we did that and then, um, <clears throat> and it was like, wow, this looks so nice, this new floor and look at the walls, they look awful. <laughs> and um, we probably should have known this, we just didn't get to paint before. And so then we started painting, Barbara came over and helped me, we did some painting, and then you got the painting done, and then you got the floor done, and then and then you noticed the trim, oh, that looks really bad, and then you just started fixing that up, you know. And then and then we had our, our couch, very, very old couch that was gonna come back up, and I just kept on looking at that couch, and I was like, oh, that really, that just, it just didn't make, it looked terrible, like all the, everything looked a little fresh and nice, and then it was gonna bring this really old, um, I mean, I bought it used when we even got it, so I don't even know how old it was, but we've had it for a long time, and then, and then I was like, Lord, can we, can we possibly find a, get a new couch, and I did get an amazing couch for $400, but that's, an, <laughs> anyways, um, but the thing is, is that as we are getting clean here, it, it, the, the cleanness and the newness of it, it, it exposes the other things that are not, that are dirty, that, that are old. And, and we really want that, but it, it takes intentionality in our daily, daily life. How am I looking at this, Lord? How am I looking at this person? Am I looking at them the way that you're looking at them? Am I looking at the situation the way you're looking at it? Am I looking at the news the way that you're looking at it? Is that your heart about this situation? I mean, I think that's your heart, but is it? I need to ask you about that. I need to. I need to check in with you. I need to. Um, I want your heart in in all circumstances. This is a narrow road to walk in a place of agreeing with God, which is very disruptive to many people because um, they don't like this reality of constantly being in a place of repentance. It's like, come on, aren't you done with this yet? Aren't we? Isn't this good enough yet? Aren't we there yet? <laughs> and um, but also being full of grace and love. Um, and having God's heart for the people around us. We, we just, we need, we need a lot of help. Psalms 139, 23 through 24 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. I'd, I'd always been um, very familiar with the NIV, but I really like this NKGV, which is better, because I just like the idea of knowing my anxieties. Because for a lot of us, there's these things that are causing us fear or anxiety and they are causing behaviors and things, perspectives on things that, that are not in agreement with God. So um, I'm going to wrap up with um, 2 Corinthians 3, 16 through 18. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled faces, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Just as Daniel in chapter 9, he, he's repenting, he's humbling himself before God on behalf of himself and on behalf of his people. This leads to what happens in chapter 10 where he receives an angelic visitation. And then he receives a massive download of prophetic information. Daniel 10, 12 through 14 says, You, Daniel, set your heart to understand. Now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days. It's powerful, but the enemy resists it. Wherever the spirit is operating, the flesh is operating also. So we're coming into an environment Obviously, we're seeing so many, I mean, it wasn't, I feel like it was just a month ago where there's all of the news about the locust taking over crops. And then we, and then we see what's happening. Um, I mean, all of these, all these signs have been happening for so long that, you know, the, the weather issues, the increase in persecution, um, the, 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 un, the recent um, shaking of the economic condition, the stock market, all of these things just continue. It's, it's like the waves get bigger and bigger and bigger, and then you don't, you almost just become immune to it. But there, there's come, we're coming into an environment where we're crying out to God to let him change us. Um, and it takes a tremendous amount of yielding. It takes a tremendous amount of faith. 
it takes a tremendous amount of vulnerability. It takes a tremendous amount of love from our brothers and sisters to support us. And um, and we want to embrace it. I'm going to read this last thing, 2 Corinthians 7, 8 through 10. 2 Corinthians 7, 8 through 10. For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did not, though I did regret it. So it's hard. It's hard to confront things. For I perceive that some that that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. Now I rejoice. Not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. And I would say from Daniel's perspective, godly sorrow, thanks, godly sorrow enables us to get clean so we can see more clearly. And the more we see clearly, the more he reveals himself to us. And this is the spirit of prophecy. It's divine information coming from heaven that we need. And that's what Daniel was getting. So on that note, I'm going to pray. Lord Jesus, <clears throat> we thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you're changing us, Lord. We thank you that you're not finished with us yet. Lord, I pray that you really would change our perspective on getting clean. I just think about a young kid that doesn't want to get in the bathtub. They're like having so much fun doing whatever they want to do. And the mom is like, you've got to take a bath. You're filthy. <laughs> You're like, no, I don't want to get in the bathtub. Lord, this is us. Would you help us to want to, fi to find the joy in getting clean? Would you help us to find the joy in trials? That we would know that the trials are perfecting us that the testing of our faith is, faith is developing perseverance and that you need that perseverance to finish the good work in us that's going to make us ready as a faithful bride. Lord Jesus, let, let this process be uh, witnessed by people all over the earth that your people by your spirit are counting in all joy. Lord, let this mark us as ones that have hope in you those that believe and know that you have hope for us, that you have plans, you have a future for us. Lord Jesus, would you show us where we're resisting you? And would you let us grieve it? Lord, we're asking, would you come take your place in the center of our hearts? Would you let us be a light to our families and to our city and to our nation? Let us be a city on a hill that's not hidden. In Jesus' name, amen.